this is how you cross over from Israel to Gaza. And right now we're in no man's land. Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied Nick Clegg? And Deputy Prime Minister, what do you think of that? Mr Trump, why should you be president? What makes you fit for the role? Is it just one big ego trip? Thank you very much. People aren't sure they can trust what you say. You exactly. say things and then it turns out that they're not quite what you say. My name's Andy Bell and I've been a journalist for over 30 years. With this podcast series, How Did We Get Here?, I aim to provide background and context to help understand a big story in the news. For this edition, I've been talking again about coronavirus, this time with the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for England, Dr Jenny Harries. We spoke as the virus appeared to be on the point of establishing itself in Britain, with the country braced to move from containing it to delaying its spread. So how will the system cope? I began by asking her about how to take the pressure off the NHS. For instance, would doctors now consult with patients by video link to keep them out of surgeries and hospitals? I think we do want to encourage these sorts of distant consultations as long as they are safe and appropriate for individual patients. Uh, the advantage of a, a video type of conference is that uh, the individual who may have an infection uh, is obviously keeping at a distance particularly from other healthcare professionals um, and if we get a rise in cases we clearly want to preserve our uh, medical workforce. What about some people who will not be comfortable with this, maybe the elderly, maybe they don't have access to you know, FaceTime or whatever you know, means it is that they could communicate? What would, what, is there a danger that you know, they could be disadvantaged? So obviously that sort of intervention is often very much welcomed by younger people and busier people. Uh, for the older people we recognise already that in our communications we need to adapt for older people who may not have smartphones or computers and the same would apply for any uh, movement towards video consultation. I think the important thing is that our emergency system, as it's set up, the planning system, links the health system directly with local authorities and local resilience fora, and so uh, local communities understand very well what their capacity is for their local systems, um, and they will often, in a time like this, uh, buddy up voluntary groups, for example, to ensure that uh, perhaps more vulnerable people have appropriate access to care. Because the name of the game presumably is to keep as many people out of hospital or GPs waiting rooms as possible. Um, I'd probably just rephrase that slightly. I think appropriately keep those people out of hospitals and waiting rooms as possible. Um, what we are seeing with this disease is that most cases are actually very mild. Uh, people can reasonably, even if they are positive cases, be at home uh, and be entirely appropriately cared for. Um, but clearly we do, the vulnerable groups you've mentioned, we do want to keep a very close eye on them um, and those are probably the people that we will be looking to attend to mostly uh, in hospitals. But in the next few weeks it's, it's likely, I think we could say from what was said yesterday, that we're going to see a lot more cases that need to be hospitalised. Where are we going to find the capacity in the NHS right now to, to actually bring those people in, get them into beds, get them into wards? So just to reassure the public, because this is a very balanced conversation really, um, we, we are expecting uh, most people to be, to be well. So we're only looking at the top 4 or 5% of the population uh, who become infected who would need access to hospitals. But nevertheless, you're right that that will put a degree of um, push, if you like, during an epidemic. Uh, on the hospital system. So I think two ways of doing that. One is we already have very good existing plans. Uh, NHS England uh, already prepares and exercises with other organisations so that they can routinely flex their beds up and down depending on what disease we have coming. Um, we have a network of high consequence infectious disease units which have, uh, if you like, step down capacity so that it increases the capacity that they have available. Um, but, uh, it, but obviously, and I think it's mentioned in the plan, that we would look to ensure that those people who were sickest and needed treatment were catered for in the NHS, and that flexing system should allow that. Will that mean that some people who would have been in hospital beds will be sent home, for instance? So obviously there will be a clinical prioritisation process in the sense of ensuring that people who need urgent treatment, and that's not just people with coronavirus, it might be for example people who are having cancer treatments, uh, can continue to have that. Um, but that flexing system always allows for some movement between people who lead, uh, need care less urgently and those who need it the most. 
I, I think the other thing is, which we may come on to, is actually trying to manage that flow into the health service. Part of the uh, consideration about looking at the modelling of the epidemic, where it might peak, and what other interventions we can do outside hospital will ensure that we can keep the bed capacity free. I mean, even if we can manage it and say it peaks in the summer when there's less pressure on the NHS, there is a concern that in order to accommodate people who might need hospitalising because of um, coronavirus, some people who would have been getting treatment otherwise, who might have been looked after otherwise in hospital, are going to be kind of shunted out. I mean, can you reassure people so, about that? So I think that that's an unfortunate description saying shunting. Uh, what we're looking to do is ensure that patients who need treatment are appropriately cared for clinically. And what you will have seen yesterday is that uh, all of the science and all of the uh, decisions, if you like, advisory uh, advice to the government is being based entirely on science, on clinical management, and that will apply to any movements in the health system as well. And when those people uh, with coronavirus, if they're being brought in, will they be always in a separate unit? Will they be isolated from everybody else? Uh, so that is something which will change over time. Obviously, at the moment, we have um, five what we call HCID units, five high-consequence infectious disease units. We're already, with the rising numbers, moving a little bit out from that. But part of that is because we're beginning to understand the disease better. We know that most people don't need significant intensive care, and so we actually don't need to be managing them in those beds. We know we can manage them at home. So there are plans to um, support people at home, make sure they still have those connections to clinical care, to be checking up on them, um, but equally to, <coughs> excuse me, to manage um, patients in uh, wards if necessary, so that we minimise any risk of uh, onward infection transmission. That's interesting. So it's people who might have been identified and, and diagnosed as having coronavirus, they could be treated at home. They could be, but with, but with particular precautions. The, the point here is actually most people, even some of those that we have been admitting in the early phase into very high consequence uh, units, are actually not needing that level of care. So I think uh, the public shouldn't be thinking uh, at the moment that cases uh, who need intensive care would be at home. That's entirely wrong. What we would be doing is looking to ensure that people who don't need intensive care but actually do have infection can be managed safely in community environments. Okay. Um, specific question about hand sanitizers. Yeah. Um, what do they need to be to be effective, and how effective are they? So the, the simple message, which is usually available to most people, is uh, get a bar of soap or get some liquid soap and uh, wash your hands with water. It can be more pleasant, perhaps, if it's hot, but any water will do, and that's a really effective way um, if you do that. But wash them for at least 20 seconds. If you're doing it really well, like a surgeon scrubbing up, it will be much nearer a minute. Um, so learning how to do that, that's the most effective. It, it is true, obviously, people who are walking, going around for, for work-based uh, or work-based environments or if they're out and about uh, might need some, some hand sanitizer. And for that, we'd recommend that the alcohol content is somewhere around 60 to 70 percent. If it's less than that, is it worth having? Or is it um, well, it's usually, you don't want to just be moving the virus around on your hands. You're trying to get rid of it. So I think that's what we recommend. But to be honest, in most places now, most work environments, it's very easy to find uh, soap and water. It's just that perhaps most people don't use it routinely. So we're trying to encourage a change in habit, particularly when people are coming into work, when they've come off public transport or that sort of thing. And masks. Yeah. Obviously, some people are wearing masks. What's the advice on masks? Um, so if you are a healthcare worker, very different, and there are some very prescribed uh, rules about that to ensure we manage uh, patient safety. If you are an ordinary member of the public, the evidence is not good. The uh, trials suggest that for two reasons. I think one, one is uh, it's effective potentially if you are a patient to prevent the virus being coughed out. Uh, but for most people, actually, they tend to get a mask, and, and it's a behavioural issue as well, they uh, put it on, they take it off, they'll perhaps put it down somewhere where they'll get the virus and put it, <coughs> excuse me, put it back on again. Um, and therefore, in some ways, they may actually risk uh, catching the disease rather than uh, preventing it. So routinely, we don't say, uh, don't recommend them. Okay. Um, I noticed the French government yesterday said they were going to buy up all the masks in France, basically, for healthcare <coughs> professionals. Should we be doing that? Um, so we already have very good stocks. We have already thought through this. It's part of the planning for coronavirus. Um, and so I think for, for all those uh, healthcare professionals that need it, we're in a very good position. Okay. I mean, and finally, are we going to get more of a sort of public information campaign now? 
Yes, so a um, big launch of um, some public campaigns which have had a lot of public input. So for example, we've understood that uh, when we're trying to persuade people to wash their hands, they don't mind their own dirt, but they're very unhappy about seeing other people's dirt. Um, so lots of work has gone in to see what works for people and encourages them to do what is a very simple intervention everybody can do, which is uh, wash their hands and uh, routinely, very thoroughly, but also, of course, use a cough or sneeze into tissues and dispose of those carefully. So a big campaign coming out on that. And um, picking up some of the issues about travel as well. Obviously, there are leaflets at airports, but we're hoping to be running some of these uh, campaigns in digital format at airports as well. Now, we are technically in, still in the uh, containment phase, I think. it was, uh, But we are we're expecting to move into another phase, aren't we? Uh, I think more likely than not, otherwise clearly we wouldn't have a plan and we wouldn't be talking in this way. There is still uh, most of the cases of coronavirus in the UK at the moment have very definite links, either to an overseas case or what we would call a, a, a first transmission route. So to somebody who has had that, we can see where they've got it from and where it's come from. What we're not seeing routinely in the UK are cases just popping up in communities which would indicate potentially sustained community transmission. Having said that, I think if you look at what's happening, uh, particularly across uh, Germany and France now in Europe, um, it is quite likely that we will see those cases in due course, and that signals a bit of a, a change of the, of the position in how we manage the, the virus. And so within weeks, are we going to see, would you expect, a, a major expansion in cases? We will do, but I think two, two points about that. One is there will be um, a gap, if you like. We should be able to detect. We've put in added surveillance systems across the country. <coughs> and we should be able to detect uh, the broadly the rise in the epidemic numbers. Um, but also we may then, at that point, and the timing is very important, we may be able to shift, if you like, some of that curve uh, to make it less of a pressure on all of our systems. And that will be an important period. And we will indicate that to the public and particularly to parts of the health system and care system that need to know. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, and this is, I promise this is the last question. There was a person to person transmission or community transmission in Surrey identified a couple of days ago, which was picked up because the GP had been asked to be one of this run mm. of 100 GPs. Yes. Now, the fact that um, that was picked up with just from just that. Is that does that ring some alarm so, bells? So I think two important things. So n number one is uh, the public should be very reassured that we have systems out there. So what that is doing is picking up what we call sentinel GP practices who routinely send us data about flu numbers and we're checking to see if we can find cases even if they haven't been reported. Um, so that's a very rare occurrence on our data currently. Um, we're doing the same with uh, severe cases of pneumonia in hospitals. So yes, we got a case. If we were seeing the majority of cases like that, that would potentially indicate we had this sustained community transmission. Uh, but as I've said previously, the majority of our cases are still clearly identified with people travelling back from countries which are affected or have direct links to cases that we know about. But if a case was identified from just those 100 GPs, does that not indicate that they could be much wider? Mm -hmm. Um, yes and no. I mean, I think the, it's a very, very small number that are coming in from that way. So I think we have no indication or currently on the data that we have of sustained community transmission. I think it is possible um, and plausible, let's put it that way, epidemiologically, that there are cases across the UK. And I know that the Chief Medical Officer has, has said that previously. Um, that sentinel surveillance system means that we can keep an eye on that. And as soon as those numbers do start to rise, the sort of unidentified cases, uh, then we will be able to put in effective uh, social uh, interventions if necessary, if we think they're going to be effective on a balanced approach. Um, and we can signal that to the system so that we can all respond together. Dr Jenny Harries, Deputy Chief Medical Officer for England. On a previous edition of How Did We Get Here, I concluded by saying that by the time people were listening, the coronavirus might be fading in our memory. Unfortunately, I was so wrong, and no doubt we'll be returning to this subject again. If you have any comments on this or any ideas for future podcasts, please email me on andy.bell at itn.co.uk. And I'm tweeting at, at andybell5news. Thank you for listening to this edition of How Did We Get Here? There'll be another along soon.